You're listening to the LaunchCast, your favorite podcast on the planet, brought to you by Launchpad 516 Studios with me, your host, George Andriopoulos. We're talking leadership, business, life, and growth right now as the countdown starts. It's like food for your ears. At this time, I'm going to ask that you fasten your seatbelts. Launch sequence. Launch sequence activated. Launch sequence activated. Five, four, three, two, one. Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome to the LaunchCast. Episode 319. It's the first LaunchCast profile episode. I got the goosebumps, as always. Doesn't matter that it's a different type of episode. We got some great stuff coming up today. This one's called Leading with Reading. Very clever, very clever name. You're going to find out why in a little bit. But let's get the business out of the way. First, it's the launch dad himself, George Andriopoulos, bringing you your favorite podcast on the planet. Leadership, business, life, growth, right now as the beat drops. Into the black hole. What is shaking, everybody? You know what my favorite thing is when I see the guest in our green room smiling during that intro. I I get so much energy out of this intro. I love you all know I love that theme song, "The Black Hole" by Tommy Lumberg, our theme song at the Launchcast. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the show. Another leadership interview today. I'm going to tell you what we're doing today. this season, we're, we're trying out some new stuff, of course. Uh, we have our Tiny Soapbox show episodes. Uh, we've had some uh, uh, moderated panels. And, of course, our deep dive leadership interviews that we always do. We're also going to be starting today. We're going to be starting this. We're going to be starting a new type of episode called LaunchCast Profiles. So these are leadership profiles of leaders in different industries uh, that we find out about. We want to do uh, quick profiles on them and what they're doing because they're doing important things uh, that I think that you guys need to know about, right? Um, We're still going to learn about their unconventional journeys to how they got here. But more importantly, these are call to actions to to kind of get you – knowledgeable and educated on different topics that we may not have touched on before and to potentially provide some resources that could help uh, uh, within those topics. So without further ado, uh, let's get to our guest. I'm going to do the the bio quick and then we'll bring him up on screen. So Danny Brussell, PhD, Dr. Danny Brussell, uh, a highly sought after speaker, trainer and coach known as the Jim Carrey with a PhD. I can't wait to find out more about that. Uh, Dr. Danny Brussell has spoken to over 3,000 audiences worldwide and authored 16 books. That's one six, including his latest Leadership Begins with Motivation. He is the co-founder of The Reading Habit Dot com. We're going to have that in the show notes. The world's top reading engagement program. So let's unmute our guest and bring him on screen. There he is. Hey, Danny. Hey, George. Thanks so much for having me. I love your show. I love your energy. And most importantly, I love that you're spreading positivity in the world. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Yeah. And, I, and thank you for uh, that was your first message to me. So I appreciate that. I uh, appreciate that you are a fan of the launch cast. Um, but I'm a fan of yours, man, after finding out about you. Um, so so let's let's pull the curtain back for our audience a little bit. It's not the easiest thing to book guests show after show after show, after, especially for a show like ours that really typically runs all year long. I know COVID uh, threw a wrench in that here and there, but we typically run like our first season was 52 weeks, uh, you know, and then we started season two with year two and we got a little smarter. We, we gave ourselves some vacation time within there, but it's not typically the easiest thing to book guests. So we do use a couple of services that we get matched up with uh, guests and we got lucky with um, uh, booking you on the show because when I saw your prof- profile, I thought it was so cool, your story uh, and really what you do. So uh, thank you for, for joining us today, Danny. Thanks a lot, George. I appreciate it. Yeah, so I, I know this is a LaunchCast profile episode, but we're going to still start it the way we start every episode. Danny, are you a leader? Everybody's a leader. At a very minimum, you're leading yourself. <laughs> yeah, so, so talk to me about that. What is your definition of a leader? 
Well, to me, a leader, uh, you know, I think John Maxwell always has the best quotes on leadership. Uh, leadership is all about influence when you're influencing others. Uh, what kind of impact are you having on others? I mean, uh, you can do whatever you want. To, you, you can say whatever you want, but unless you're impacting others, there's no point for you to be here. Yeah, I love that. Um, we talk about some stuff, and, and I want to get into to the the history behind what you do and and how you kind of got to it. Uh, we talk about something on the show called leadership spark moments, right? That we all, as as leadership experts or, or coaches or whatever it is that we do out there in the ether, we we develop these little key buzzwords that sort of matter to what we're trying to put out there in the world. So for me, in my journey, I remember pinpointing certain moments. Um, in my journey along, you know, before I became a leader, as I was sort of finding my way. Um, and I call them spark moments, moments in life that take you down a path that you can think back and you know that because of this moment, you went down a path, good, bad, or indifferent. And that path, that path created some kind of major change in, in your life or a shift in your life. Um, what was the moment for you? And then we'll, we'll kind of get into the, the, chronology of all this, but what was the moment for you where reading became such an important part of your life? That's a great question, George. I mean, uh, it's ironic that I'm known as America's leading reading ambassador because I grew up hating reading. My father is a librarian and uh, I always hated the public library. It always smelled funny. There was always <laughs> uncomfortable furniture. There was always some elderly woman telling me to be quiet. And uh, there's always some freaky homeless guy who thinks he's a vampire hanging out by the bookshelves. I always hated it. And it wasn't until I started teaching in the inner city in South Central LA, where I noticed that most of my students didn't have a lot of the advantages I had growing up. And I said, shame on me. I mean, I was very blessed. I had both of my parents in the home. Uh, we were we weren't uh, we were lower middle class, but we always had food on the table. And my parents always read in front of us to us, and we had plenty of access to reading materials. And it really became my passion uh, to inspire my kids to love reading. Uh, that's what I always tell people about my program. Uh, you know, I think schools do an adequate job of teaching kids how to read. But the question I always ask people is, what good is it teaching a kid how to read if they never want to read? I teach kids why to read because I've never had to tell a kid, go watch TV. I've never had to tell a kid, go play a video game. And I never want to have to tell a kid, go read a book. I want them to choose to read because they think it's fascinating. And I, I, I can tell you, in my studies of leaders, there's plenty of readers that don't necessarily become effective leaders. But I have never read about an effective leader that was not an avid reader. Yeah, you know, there, there's this thing that I, 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 I noticed I don't know if it's when I went through it or, or just seeing other people go through it. G go with me on this because you're, you're an educator, so you can, you can totally understand and, and relate to this. Um, there has to be a certain level of engagement and or maturity that brings you to the point where um, whether it's reading or schooling becomes um, more palatable, right? more easily digestible for you. And you kind of understand that, like, if I look at it in a different way, I want to kind of dive into that concept for a minute because um, I, I recently had this conversation with, um, with a friend, right? So, so my, 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 my great friends, their son is graduating uh, college um, at the end of May and, you know, just got his first teaching job and, and everybody's so proud of him. And this wasn't a bookworm. Right. This was a, a kid that when he started college, um, you know, there, there was a little bit of, of struggle like on on academic probation initially. And then it was just like this thing that just clicked. And and it all of a sudden the kid became I don't know if he's a 4 student, but he became a great student after that. Very engaged in what he was doing. I've also seen that in people that, you know, start college, drop out, and then come back later in life, and all of a sudden they're 4 students, right? There's just this thing, this level of maturity. I, I did it as well, you know, I finished college 20 years ago, and I started my MBA um, a few years back, and it was like the struggle that I had in school, mostly because I didn't have the time for, for the books at the time, because I was working a lot and everything, but it just kind of went away. Now it's like, not only am I running my own few companies and, and have a wife and kids and everything like that, but, you know, doing school and getting four O's in between, I always thought that was the most interesting thing. Like, what is that thing that just sparks the engagement? Uh, or can you help us shed some light on that? 
Yeah, so the happiest day of my life, besides my wedding day, was when I got my PhD, I was grinning from ear to ear, and my wife said, why are you so happy? And I said, because from now on, I get to choose the books. And that's what <laughs> reading really is. I mean, I remember in high school, uh, one of my English teachers forced us to read The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. And I'm not going to put down the book, because I'm sure there's plenty of people in this audience that love that book. But the book is basically about uh, Hester Prim. Uh, Prim, she uh, commits adultery, and so she has to wear an A on her chest for adultery. And I asked my teacher if I could wear a B on my chest, because I was so bored reading that book. It drove me <laughs> And isn't it great now that we're at a stage in our lives, George, where we read because we want to read for entertainment or we want to read for information? I know you're just like me, that you're going to be interested in reading lots of leadership books. I'm constantly reading uh, biographies of successful people and uh, all the uh, the leadership. I mean, I, I, I can devour anything that John Maxwell sure. writes. Uh, when I was a kid, I always loved it at 12, 15, because uh, Paul Harvey would come on the radio and he, you know, he passed away a couple of years ago at the age of 325 years old. But he'd always <laughs> come up there and he'd say, I'm Paul Harvey with the rest of the story. And so when I was teaching middle school, I was the only teacher in the history of my school to have zero tardies because I always started off my class by reading a, a Paul Harvey story to the kids. And the kids always wanted to hear what was going to happen. And actually the reason I wrote the Leadership Begins with Motivation book was because Paul Harvey stories are about people like J.C. Penney and Sears Roebuck. And most of my kids don't even know who those people are. And so I realized I had to write an updated version. So I have profiles on people like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. And, and actually, it was interesting when I finished that book completely unintentionally, I realized too many of my examples in that book are of white male Americans. I'm like, wow, I need to expand that. And so the book I'm writing right now focuses much more on females, minorities and international examples. Oh, I so love I, that. I it's really with the spark, George, is, you know, and I think you found it, too, is uh, we should want to read. We shouldn't have to read. Yeah. And, I, and a, a funny story with this. Um, in my youth, right, I was I was a, I, I will admit I still watch this from time to time. I was a huge uh, wrestling fan in my youth. I mean, I grew up in the in the 80s with Hulk Hogan and Macho Man Randy Savage and all these guys. And um, there was sort of like this resurgence in my late teens where I would watch it. You know, guys like Dwayne The Rock Johnson and Stone Cold Steve Austin are, are around. And um, the WWE, <laughs> excuse me, the WWE as an organization um, got into books and they, and they thought they could make money with book writing and biographies. And so all of these wrestlers started coming out with these biographies. And I went from a guy that just never cared to read a book to all of a sudden I'm reading these books and then, okay, the whole wrestling fad went away ish for me. And, you know, I'm a sports guy. I start reading, you know, Phil Jackson's book on coaching and old, uh, you know, basketball coaching books and, and biographies and all this. And then, then it gets into when I get to the, the point of maturity in my life where business and leadership became a thing. And now I'm reading things that are might bore the hell out of somebody else, but just so fascinating and engaging to me. And so, yeah, there's a there's a there's a certain level of engagement that you have to have in the content. And there's an evolution, even in yourself, a maturity that you have to kind of be aware of and, and I guess be willing to accept, you know, when it kind of gets there so that you can continue and make reading a sustainable thing because I, I promise you and and I know you can speak to this better that um, if you educate yourself and you keep reading and you just keep building building making sharpening the knife sharpening the iron uh, sky's the limit sky's the limit absolutely well and don't put yourself down, George. I mean, I would continue reading things like that. I would recommend uh, the biography by Mankind was one of the best wrestling books I had ever read. I was I was fascinated. Actually, the book I'm reading right now, and it's it's it me. I can't think of the title, and I can't think of the author. I know the author is a uh, a writer, I think, for the New York Post. Uh, but it's a a profile on uh, Bill Walsh, Joe Gibbs, and Bill Parcells being the most successful. All of them won at least two Super Bowls in the 1980s, and it's just fascinating. I mean. I, I would recommend that book to any leader because I'll put it, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, after the show, I'll, I'll give you the show notes, uh, the title and the Please. author, because what I love the best about this book is it it starts off with each of those three coaches at their lowest. I mean, Bill Walsh was supposed to be the heir apparent to Paul Brown to coach the Cincinnati Bengals. And Paul Brown decided he was going to make the offensive line 
coach, his, his head coach. And so Bill Walsh flew to California. He was in tears to his best friend. He said, I don't know what I'm going to do. He wound up coaching Stanford and Eddie DeBartolo watched Stanford win the blue bonnet bowl. And he said, that's the guy I want to coach the 49ers. And Bill Walsh lost his very first seven games as the head coach of the San Francisco 49ers. And he was despondent. He was, he was going to resign and he decided, no, I got it. I got to stick with it. And two years later, he wins the Super Bowl. Joe Gibbs, he started off his career losing his first five games, and they were going to fire him, and he stuck with it. And in his second season, he won the Super Bowl with the with, – uh, now we call them the Washington – what do they call them? The Commanders now, but they used to be the Washington yeah. Redskins. Uh, and Bill Parcells, I mean, his first year coaching was horrible. He was – I think he was like 3-12-1 and one. – Everybody was calling for his job. His first year coaching, he lost his mother, his father, one of his coaches, one of his players all died. It was like the worst year of his life. And then he decided second year, he's like, if I'm going down, I'm going down my way. And he changed his approach. And within a couple of years, you know, he wins a couple more, a couple of Super Bowls. And what I love about that was every leader's journey. You know, we look at these people when they're on top, but I love to look at them when they're on the bottom. And what was the choices they made when they were at their lowest point? It's just a wonderful book. And uh, you have to send that to me. Oh, I I love it. But I mean, the the real point is don't put down what you're reading. I mean, a lot of those wrestling books have some of the best anecdotes I've ever, I've, I'm always looking for anecdotes whenever I find, and I mean, I was just oh, they're great. All- yeah, and Mick Foley's yeah. a, an amazing author. He's gone on to be a multiple, multi-time New York Times bestselling author. Yeah. He's. Uh, I'm gonna. I, I'm gonna tell you why I'm interested in that book. By the way, let me just hold on. Let me make this my primary screen. So this is the other yeah, side I of the studio it. here. Yeah. So you see, you see Joe Montana there, right at the bottom, right? Yep. <laughs> great. I love it. Yeah. Amazing. And now a word from our sponsors. Well, that's a nice song. Hey, hey, everybody. It's me, the launch dad himself, George Andriopoulos, the host of the LaunchCast, the co-host of Over My Dad Podcast. But more importantly, I'm here today on behalf of Launchpad 516 Studios, the podcast production company that makes those two shows, the one you're listening to now, and so many others possible. Now, What is Launchpad 516 Studios? Well, it's the brainchild of Launchpad 516. It's a podcast production company, and we help you from conceptualization to production to recording to post-production to monetization. The key word here, let's turn that hobby, that idea into a revenue stream. But more importantly, let's get that important idea out there and get your voice heard because that's what matters right now. Hit us up, launchpad516studios.com to find out more information or send us an email, podcast at lp516.com. DM me at launchpadceo on all the platforms. Let's chat. Let's get your voice heard. We're pretty good at this, guys. Don't let this offer slip by you. Later, guys. Beep, beep. We are interrupting this show to tell you about our podcast with a very special announcement. Hey folks, I hope you're enjoying your podcast which you're listening to right now. But I would like to tell you about another one. We are Sounds Like Autism. Produced by Launchpad 516 Studios. Which is full of impactful programming. It's the podcast that celebrates neurodiversity by speaking to the people who are helping to create a more inclusive world. I am Dave Thompson. I am an educator and an innovator and a leader within the space of helping the world become a more inclusive place for neurodivergent people as a neurodivergent self-advocate myself. And my co-host, Josh Mursky, is an incredible, hardworking, big picture dude who is on the autism spectrum and super stoked to spread his message of inclusion along with me. We've had folks on from all over, all walks of life, all over the country, and more. You don't need to be someone who is autistic yourself or have skin in the game. You don't need a family member or a neighbor who is autistic. You probably have one, but you don't need any of that to get stoked on neurodiversity and inclusion. We're confident that if you give us a shot, if you join us on our journey, that you'll be a lifer and you'll be fully invested in this mission. We are just so delighted and honored to have this kind of platform to share with you all what we do 
do, check us out. I hope you enjoy your current podcast, and then after that, skedaddle and come right over here to Sounds Like Autism and check us out. Now, back to the show. You're listening to The LaunchCast, produced by Launchpad 516 Studios, with me, your host, the launch dad himself, George Andriopoulos. Um, okay, great. So I'm going to, I'm going to dive into a little bit of the backstory and then I'm going to ask you some questions, uh, specifically about reading as we wrap up the, uh, the profile. Um, so you began teaching your teaching career in South central LA Compton, uh, which I'm yeah. sure was, um, very challenging for you. Uh, and you've spent the, the better part of 25 years showing people how to read more, read better and love reading as reading is one of the essential keys to success. Um, you co-founded the world's leading reading engagement program five years ago, and you have big plans coming up for this. Uh, your most recent book, which you mentioned, uh, Leadership Begins with Motivation. So talk to us a little bit about that journey. Um, if you can give us the Cliff's Notes version. Yeah, I mean, so I, I've taught all age levels. I started off teaching, uh, you know, I, I saw the movie Stand and Deliver, and uh, it's a story of uh, uh, Jaime Escalante going to Garfield High School in East Los Angeles to, to teach advanced placement calculus. So I said, I'm gonna be Jaime Escalante. So I originally was a, a 12th grade social studies in, in Compton, California, and they switched me from working with high school students to middle school students, to upper elementary, to lower elementary, to pretty soon, instead of preparing kids for college, I was coming home with snot marks all over my pants from my little ones hugging me all day. And I learned really quickly, what works with a 12th grader does not necessarily work with a kindergartner, but what works with a kindergartner works with all age levels. I mean, even when I do corporate trainings now, when when there's no energy in the room, I'm like, I, I warn them. I'm like, if you don't pick this up, we're going to start singing for the next hour and I'm going to get you up and moving. And it's fascinating. I, this is where you were. It was great when you were talking about the wrestling books. I, I asked probably at this point over 100,000 people. I've always said tens of thousands, but it's got to be over 100,000 <laughs> at this point. Now, I'll ask corporate audiences. I'm like, what was your favorite book growing up? And these are all the, the people in suits, the important people. And I guarantee you 70% of the audience says Superman, Fantastic Four, Spider-Man. I'm like, you know, most people associate literature with Dostoevsky. I mean, Literature does not have to be an 850 page Russian book. You know, uh, another one of my websites, lazyreaders.com is the top book club online. And every month I provide 10 book recommendations, three or four adult level, three or four young adult level, and three or four children's level books, all under 250 pages. So you have something you can read when you're stuck at the doctor's office. Uh, one of the tips I give to people, you know, if you wanna look smart before you go to a party, Go to Barnes and Noble, go to the children's section and read uh, picture book biographies of famous people. You'll have all kinds of amazing information at your disposal. We we discount the the easy reading, but the easy reading is what makes you a passionate reader. Yep. Yep. Amazing. Amazing. Um, I want to ask you a, 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 a couple of questions specifically about reading. Um, uh, the, the, and the one and this kind of speaks to what we were speaking about b before uh, we can get into the background of why people don't read and, and how to engage people. But um, I, it's an honest question as to like an easy uh, like a process, because I, I know you you do coaching and, and we'll share your, your website and everything. How if you can sort of encompass this in a couple of sentences, how do you get people to read more? Great. I'll give a couple of quick tips right now. So a lot of parents will tell me I have nothing to read at home. I'm like, oh, you do. Uh, President Bush Sr. Uh, 30 years ago signed a very important law in this country. It says every television set in America has to have closed captioning. One of the quick tips I give to parents is turn on the closed captioning on your TV. And people say, well, wait a sec. If the show's in English and the subtitles are in English, what good does that do? I'm like, well, that's a fair point, but let me make a point. Have you ever watched a show with subtitles and not looked at the subtitles? It's very difficult to do. Your brain is directed towards that text, and there's actually research that supports this. If you look at reading scores around the world, the more kids watch TV, the lower their reading scores are in every country in the world except for one. The country with the highest reading scores in the world watches the most TV in the world. It's Finland, and people always ask me, well, how could that be? I'm like, well, because Finland makes really bad TV shows, and so they have to import old Gilligan's Islands and Brady Bunches and they have to subtitle them all. The kids are reading constantly. That's a quick way to get reading. You know, a lot of people don't know this, over half of the Fortune 500 CEOs are dyslexic. 
Well, dyslexia is a reading problem. All reading problems are, are curable, by the way, but dyslexics tend to process information better at an auditory level. And so one of the big tips I give to people is the research is quite clear. Listening to books is just as well, just as good as uh, reading them on your own. So listen to audio books. I mean, that's why I listen to podcasts. I want to listen to positive things. I'm, I'm constantly listening. to. I was just listening to uh, Malcolm Gladwell's latest book, Talking to Strangers. Wonderful audio book. Uh, uh, Will Smith's uh, uh, biography by Mark Manson. Will is narrated by Will Smith. It's a fantastic uh, lesson. And actually, there's some great lessons in leadership. So uh, those are just two quick tips to help the people that are struggling out there. Yeah, amazing. Um, the next question I wanted to ask you is, uh, and, and this this ties to the mission of the show and what we're trying to do here. What role does reading play in leadership? <coughs> Excuse me. Let me do that again. <coughs> what role does reading play in leadership? I know you touched on, you know, uh, 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 Fortune 500 CEOs and 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 everything like that. Um, but to me, it's it's kind of no secret that you said before, show me a successful person that doesn't read a lot, right? So talk to me about that. Yeah, and it doesn't really matter what the field is, whether it's in government, in the military, in politics, in uh, in business, in, in sports. I mean, I could have kissed LeBron James uh, when he was in his first NBA Finals with the Miami Heat. They showed him in the locker room before the uh, championship, and he was reading uh, The Hunger Games by Suzanne Collins. And I could have kissed him because I'm like, dude, you just did more for reading, getting kids excited, than I can ever do. That was wonderful. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that uh, – John F. Kennedy, when he first became president, uh, a member of the press asked him, what are you reading? And he said, oh, I'm reading this interesting uh, spy book called, uh, uh, it's by this guy named Ian Fleming about this Agent 007. Because of that statement, Hollywood bought the rights to it and they filmed, they started the James Bond series. Uh, you know, that's what leaders, it, it doesn't matter what you do. I mean, Norman Schwarzkopf, General Schwarzkopf, you know, I always tell people, if you're talking to a four or five star general, I mean, these people are brilliant. I mean, Schwarzkopf could quote Shakespeare just off the top of his head. Here's a quick tip I give people. All of us have these things called phones, cell phones right now. I have updates every day on my phone. So like right now I just read Dune and there's a thing called the litany against fear in Dune. So every day at 9-11, I have an alert to remember, to try and memorize, you know, it's the litany against fear is I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that, that is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my, you know, so I'm doing that. Uh, I'm trying to learn different pieces of scripture. And so like when I want to learn James 1, one two three at 123 every day i have an update right now i'm also trying to learn the uh the king henry v his saint crispian's day speech which is act four scene three and so at 403 every day i go through henry v saint crispian's day speech so this is what leaders are doing constantly i mean warren buffett's is, you know one of the richest men in the world and all he says all he does every day from from the time he gets to the office to the time he leaves the office is he reads he's constantly reading yeah yeah incredible um, last question before we move on to the big three. Um, and again, I think, I think it's like, as I ask these questions to kind of start answering the, <laughs> the next question, but just, so, just so I know that I asked this and we can get a clear answer for our audience. Uh, talk to me about the relationship between reading and success. Yeah. I, I, again, you, you're not going to be, I mean, there's, there's, it's kind of like wearing your seatbelt. There's always the one person that survives the crash that wasn't wearing the seatbelt. <laughs> yeah. Percent of people, they seatbelts are a good thing. Same thing with reading. I mean, I I, I have a friend that uh, graduated from a prestigious Ivy League school that likes to boast that that was the last time he read a book. And I'm like, well, you're stupid. You know, uh, if you're not reading, you're not growing. And if you're not growing, you're dying a little bit every single day. I want to be around people like you, people like your listeners who are constantly trying to figure out ways to get better every day. That's our that's our goal as leaders. Is can I get a little bit better today? That's, yeah. that's our ministry every single day. Love that. Love that. All right. Let's move on to the big three. The big three from the launch cast. The big three is going to be a little bit different in launch cast profiles. We're actually doing one question for the big three because we're trying to keep these as short, concise episodes. Uh, so one question for the big three. The big three is where normally we throw out a couple of topics. You give us your top three uh, answers on each quick, concise answers. But I couldn't, I couldn't help but ask you for this one. Three favorite books. 
And I know oh, this well. is like this is like almost asking like, give me your three favorite children out of all your children, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a tough one. And of course, everybody has to say the Bible is always going to be. With, but I'm going to go since this is a leadership podcast. I'll give you three of my favorite leadership books. Uh, the book that really changed my life was The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt by Edmund Morris. It actually won the Pulitzer Prize in 1979. I got to admit, before I read that book, I knew only two things about Teddy Roosevelt. I knew that teddy bears were named after him. And for some reason, his face was on Mount Rushmore. This is part of a trilogy about Teddy Roosevelt. They don't make him like Teddy Roosevelt anymore. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, this guy, uh, when he was 36 years old, he was police commissioner of New York City. When he was 37, he was assistant secretary of the United States Navy. When he was 38, he led the Rough Riders up San Juan Hill in the Spanish-American War. When he was 40, he was elected governor of New York, and he didn't even have an affair. When he was 42, he was elected vice president of the United States. Later that year, following the assassination of President McKinley, Teddy Roosevelt became then and to this day the youngest president in American history. I mean, not a bad six year period. You know, I, I I'm pretty proud that I've gone three months without a parking ticket. This guy set the bar pretty high. But reading that biography, George, I was fascinated. Uh, uh, Teddy was sick all the time as a kid. And so he spent all this time reading. He was uh, he was a speed reader. He had a photographic memory and he could read in eight languages. They say you could give him an 800 page book in Latin at dinner and he would quote pages to you at the uh, dinner table. By the time he was 30 years old, they say Teddy Roosevelt had read over 20,000 books. Wow. And even when he was president, he read three books a day. So you got to read that book. Uh, it's wonderful. Uh, I love John Wooden's They Call Me Coach. I'll read anything by Coach Wooden. Uh, even though I went to USC, I mean, I would have loved to have met uh, a, a UCLA legend. Just And it's March Madness. Uh, I get excited about that. And then, uh, uh, you know, actually, uh, uh, The Success Principles by Jack Canfield. That book... Uh, when I bought it, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, he's put, in a, he's put a $25,000 coaching program in a $20 book. It has some of the best anecdotes I've ever read. Um, I, I would have paid $20 just for the bibliography sure. in that. So, so sure. those are three of my favorite leadership books for your awesome. audience. Awesome. Uh, guys, to thank us, to thank our audience, Danny's going to supply us uh, with a complimentary e-copy of his book, Read, Lead, and Succeed, which provides inspirational quotes and stories and adult and children's level book recommendations. He's also going to provide two digital trainings for parents interested in helping their children read more, read better, and love reading, right? All right, and we'll put Absolutely. all of that. We're going to put all of that in our show notes. Uh, thank you so much, Danny, for being here, folks. Doctor Danny Brissell. He didn't go to PhD school to be called Mister Danny Brissell, so we're going to call him. No, that, there's no such thing as PhD school. There's just I more like school. <laughs> all right, Danny, thank you for joining us today. I'm going to put you back in the green room for just a minute while I wrap up. Right. If I can get my tech working. All right. Another one. Another one. As my man DJ Khaled says, another one. 319 in the books. We tear up the show notes. We're all done with this. Thank you to Dr. Danny Brissell for joining us today. Thank you guys for checking out the first ever LaunchCast profile. What did we do this in? That's 30 minutes. 30 minutes, two, one, 30 minutes on the dot. I am impressed with myself. We'll see you guys next week, every Monday. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all of them. You know the deal. Later, guys. Launch sequence terminated. Into the black hole. Into the black hole. The LaunchCast is brought to you by Launchpad 516 Studios. Produced by Fabrizio Fugazi and executive produced by George Andriopoulos. Marketing and PR by Media Convergence. Theme song by Tommy Lungberg. Music and sound effects are licensed through Epidemic Sound. The LaunchCast is hosted with Podbean. Make sure to subscribe to this feed wherever podcasts are available and leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts while you're at it, guys. You can find the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Pandora, TuneIn, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, Podbean, and everywhere else that podcasts are available. Follow me, George Andriopoulos, the host at Launchpad CEO on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, or follow the show at The Launchcast Show on Facebook and Instagram, or at Launchcast Show on Twitter. Visit our website, thelaunchcast.com, and make sure to follow all the great podcasts produced by Launchpad 516 Studios. We'll see you next time, guys.